Hello, in this video, I will give a brief introduction to special relativity. We start with classical relativity. Up until the 20th century, we used classical mechanics, and this was developed by scientists like Kepler, Galileo, and Newton. The conditions for using Newton's laws is that you have to be an inertial observer. But an inertial observer is defined as anyone who can use Newton's laws. This sounds like circular reasoning, so to get around this, we assume that there does exist an inertial observer somewhere in the universe, and that anyone moving at constant velocity with respect to this person is also counted as an inertial observer. Galilean transformations, such as a translation or a rotation in space, should not affect one's ability to do physics. And if you're moving at a constant velocity with respect to someone that's inertial, you should also be able to do physics and the coordinate with using the coordinate transformations listed above. By 1900, Maxwell had formulated the four equations of electromagnetism. Two of these laws predict that a changing electric field will induce a magnetic field and vice versa. Using these concepts and the classical wave equation, we predicted an equation for the oscillation of electric and magnetic fields. This wave had a speed of around 3 times 10 to the 8th meters of a second, and in fact, nowadays, we know this value so precisely that we actually use it to define the meter. The result is that light was an electromagnetic wave, and that the propagation of electromagnetic waves predicts the direction of light propagation. The interesting thing about the wave equation is that everything was done completely independently of any source. So the question became, what is the speed relative to? Because all speeds are relative to something according to classical relativity. One of the major ideas at the time was that there was a furnace ether that light traveled through at this speed. Michelson and Morley were two scientists who conducted an experiment to determine the speed of the Earth with respect to this ether. To go about this, they set up a light beam that would intersect a mirror and be split up into perpendicular directions. The theory was that if Earth was moving with respect to this ether, there would be measurable interference pattern in the slit since one beam would take a different time than the other to cover the same distance. However, the experiment yielded no difference. At the time, they assumed that the Earth was at rest with respect to the ether, so they performed this experiment about half a year later when the Earth was in a completely different position in the universe and going in a completely different direction, but there was still no difference. At this point, the going conclusion was that there was no ether in the universe. At this point, Einstein comes in and he introduces the special theory of relativity with two postulates. The first one effectively agrees with relativity of classical mechanics. And it says that it's impossible to detect, detect any speed or velocity unless you're traveling relative to something, and that all inertial observers are equally fit to use the laws of physics. The second one is new, and this states that the speed of light experienced by any inertial reference frame is constant. And this confirms the results of Michelson and Morley experiments since they measured the same speed of light at two completely different points in the universe. This also agrees with the electromagnetic wave equation. Thinking about this further, it makes sense. For example, a sound is a wave that travels across the medium of air. Because of this, there's a measurable difference in the Doppler effect between two, the situations when you're moving towards a source or a source is moving towards you. But if sound did not travel through a medium, there would be no way to tell if you're moving towards a source or the source is moving towards you. Since light is more of a universal situation, you should not be able to tell if you're moving with respect to someone or they're moving with respect to you just using light. So Einstein's uh, postulate that light is constant as measured by all inertial reference frame makes sense. Using these postulates, we can derive the Lorentz transformations. Consider the two following reference frame S and S prime, with S prime moving to the right um, as measured by S with a constant speed V. Then let them both start their stopwatches when they pass each other, at which point the flashlight also signs a beam towards the right. According to S, they should expect S prime to measure a smaller distance of how far light is propagated since the light and S are traveling, S prime are traveling in the same direction. But S prime sees the same speed of light C in his reference frame, and both of them can accuse each other of using shorter scales um, due to symmetry and ending up with a larger measurement of distance. The way to get around this is to apply a gamma factor to the classical conversions, and then doing the algebra and using the postulates, the gamma factor comes out to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v over c quantity squared. This shows that gamma is always larger than 1. In addition, if the speeds in question, the v's, are much less than c, you get 1 over square root of 1 minus a very small number squared, which is basically 1. This shows why the classical conversions of relativity where the speeds are much smaller than the speed of light sort of approximate down to x minus vt and t minus v over c squared times x. 
Some consequences of this is the first one that simultaneity is no longer the case. In classical relativity, we assume that t is equal to t prime as measured by two reference frames, but using these Lorentz transformations, we see that that's no longer the case. The two other interesting consequences are length contraction and time dilation. Consider the proper length of an object. This is the length measured by someone at, res at rest with respect to that object. And this object is transfer tra traveling at uniform speed with respect to you. You make simultaneous measurements of the coordinates of the left and right end of the object in your frame and subtract them to get the length. This means that delta t goes to zero and you end up with a length that you measure and this is contracted from the proper length of the object by a factor times of one over gamma. Where one over gamma is one over a number larger than one, so it's smaller than one. For time dilation, a person at, res at rest with respect to an object does not measure a position difference in his frame, meaning delta x prime is zero. But he will measure a time difference, and you will measure a time difference that will be a factor of gamma larger than his time difference, hence the word dilation. Two interesting considerations of this is, for one, it's, it might actually be possible to fit a large truck in a small garage by moving the truck at a very large speed, because simultaneity is violated um, using the new laws of relativity, and there's a time instant where the observer in the, um, in the garage frame, where a length contracted truck actually fits into the garage. Another consideration is the traveling twins experiment. For example, if one twin leaves the Earth at a constant speed and comes back, then it appears that they, bo they can both claim that they are younger and the other, one, uh, the other twin is older because of time dilation. So how, how would we get around this? If the twin comes back to Earth to see the result, then at some point he has turned around because he, went, he started off by going in one direction and he had to turn around and come back, meaning this required an acceleration. Therefore, he's no longer in the inertial reference frame that he started out in, and the symmetry is violated. A very useful application is invariance, because right now it seems like simultaneity is violated, the x's, the, the lengths are no longer agreement in terms of observers, and so are the times. A useful application is invariance. Even though energy, momentum, velocity, speed, and position are now dependent on the reference frame, certain combinations of these quantities are actually invariant, such as the equations shown above. This is useful when one reference frame might be easier to work with in a problem than another for particle collisions and decays. Thanks for watching.